To be a leader requires one thing and one thing only. Followers. That's it. That the real reason anyone follows anyone else is because they trust them. To be a real leader, you have to be able to get people to follow you because they want you and they trust you. And that's commitment. Right now, you have the power to show leadership in every single thing you do. The two words, management and leadership, are often used as synonyms. That is to say, people don't even notice that in one sentence they're saying one, in one sentence they're saying another, and they're thinking the same thing, whatever it is. Um, or um, they think that the guys on top do leadership, whatever that is, and the guys in the middle or lower uh, do management. Both are wrong, both are dangerous, and both are increasingly a, a problem in a world that's changing faster and faster. There's practical everyday management. I'm not interested in that. Leadership is not practical and it's not everyday. Management and leadership are totally different things. You think you're being a leader, but you're probably being a manager. Managers figure out what they want done and get people to do it. Managers try to get people to do what they did yesterday, but a little faster and a little cheaper with a few more, few less defects, right? And it probably has a place, but it's not interesting to me. What's essential, what's not happening is leadership. Leadership is about finding the right people, agreeing on where you want to go, and getting out of the way. Leadership means embracing the failure of your people if it leads to growth. Leadership means not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, just knowing it's going to take you where you want to go. And that's really hard, particularly for people who have self-identified as small business people because they're afraid of becoming big. Of, of most of the people who are running businesses today, and I mean the vast, vast majority, it's we manage the people with the goal of getting better products, serving the customer better, in other words, doing the work, whatever the work is, better. And, and that's the goal of managing people. Unfortunately, that's a result. That, that really isn't the goal of managing people. That's the goal of managing work. And most of the managers apply the vast majority of their time to managing the work, which means that they go down and they find something wrong, find something that's needed, then they give another order and they're constantly giving these orders to adjust the work. Well, what they're not doing is managing people. Managing is about doing things right. Leadership, on the other hand, is about doing the right things. You see, today's good managers, they manage and control the work environment. They control processes. They control procedures. They control the work environment. They focus on getting the products and services out on time, on spec, on budget. And that's great. Leaders, on the other hand, not only manage, but they're also more visionary. They understand a much broader picture. They understand that getting it done on spec, on time, on budget today may not be good tomorrow, so I gotta find ways to do it better than the competition, and I gotta find those ways now. They also understand, in order to be an effective leader, you have to surround yourself with good people. In a traditional organization, a leader or a manager in the org chart has power over people, but a true leader has power with people, which is to say that even if they don't have organizational power, they have the skills that will enable them to get uh, cooperation and support and loyalty, not because people have to follow them, but because they want to. At the top of most organizations, we have individuals or teams of individuals. Some believe that they're managers, some believe that they're leaders. A huge difference between the qualities of a manager and the qualities of a leader. Management is about excellence today. Leadership is about the promise and the opportunities of the future. Managers manage in the present. 
leaders lead to the future. We're all going to be living in the future. We need leaders who can take us there. Leadership is about the vision part of a business. Management is about the mission part of the business. So if leadership says, this is the destination, management helps sets the route, sets the course. And they're two very, very different disciplines. Um, management is about dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Leadership is about the sentiment of the statement that you're writing. You know, uh, management's about the grammar. For me, to lead is to lead change. We've probably all heard in some form or another this idea that managers improve what is and leaders go beyond what is. Managers are built to prove. They are motivated by efficiencies. Leaders paint. They paint a future. They're motivated by passion and opportunity. Huge difference between the two. We need to understand the difference between a mindset of exploitation, getting more from what we have, and a mindset of exploration, which is getting new and different from things that are unfamiliar. That's the difference. We need to understand it, and we need to understand what the environment is asking of us. They're asking us to discover. I think the leadership requirements over the next 10 years are going to be very challenging and to some extent quite different from the past. You know, we are living in quite turbulent times. We all know that. I think what's more critical to, to understand or at least accept is there are big tectonic shifts, if you will, gravitational forces underway. The rise of the East or of the emerging markets versus the West. The, the plethora of technology and what that's doing, the disruptions, the opportunities and so forth that's going on, which we're seeing literally on a day-to-day -day basis. The aging population, uh, the scarcity of resources. There's, each one of these is massive in itself and they're all happening together. So I think we're, we just have to accept we're living in a very volatile period as, as we shift to into this new century. If you go down through history and look at people who um, everyone talks about as, uh, as, as a great leader, uh, they don't talk about that stuff. They talk much more about vision. They talk much more about people uh, believing and in, buying into that vision, often through um, various uh, methods of uh, communication. They talk a lot about energy and empowerment and motivation and inspiration. Uh, and if you ask yourself, well, what if management kind of runs this organization that shouldn't be able to function, it's too big, it's too spread out, it's too complicated. What leadership tends to do, it, it tends to be much more at the heart of creating things in the first place or changing them in significant ways to take advantages of opportunities or to duck hazards or to take a group and literally the same people uh, getting them to pave, behave in new and different ways that produce um, much, much, much better um, outcomes. Uh, this time around, the challenge is on leaders everywhere. And the, the thought underneath this is that we live in a world where never before has leadership been so necessary, so needed, but where so often leaders seem to come up short. Our sense is this is not really a problem of individuals. This is a problem of organizational structures, those traditional pyramidal structures that demand too much of too few and not enough of everyone else. So and the old command and control that grew out of the military and was successful in the 50s and 60s started to erode in the 70s and totally collapsed in the 80s. Uh, it came about because we had a military structure that we knew, and we had no Japan and no Germany as competitors. So it worked for 20 years and it became the model. And so that had to get taken out. And now the most organizations that are successful today, uh, the quality of an idea determines whether it's adopted or not, not where it came from in the organizational hierarchy. People have to be able to energize and excite those in the organization to reach for new heights. 
and uh, they have to ask them to contribute to each other. An orchestra doesn't play very well if you have all individuals playing beautiful music, but that, it doesn't come together. And so you, uh, you really have to be a conductor of an orchestra, a motivator, an energizer, a cheerleader, uh, and you've got to bring people together. It's important for leaders to realize that it's, leading is really more than just directing people and telling them what to do. That is a type of leadership, but it doesn't tend to be the most constructive. What we found working with human synergistics is there are constructive leadership styles that are more affiliative, they're more self-actuating, they're, they're more achievement-oriented. All those things are positive, positive leadership models. So if you're not using those, leadership can be pretty tough. It can be really hard. It can be a grind. If you, you start moving into the positive realm and you can replicate that with the rest of your team, it can make a terrific difference. So it's not so hard. It doesn't feel like you're slogging through mud. It's, uh, it's energizing. It's actually a lot of fun. Which and a good leader at one position may or may not be a good leader at another position. Companies change, expectations change, people change. You can't make an assumption that great leader X, first line supervisor, is going to be a great CEO. And you can't make the assumption that a great CEO in one company is necessarily going to be a great CEO in another company. Doesn't always work. Does the person fit that situation? And the history of leadership research has focused primarily on the leader. Um, in Western societies, in the United States, in much of Europe, the, um, the focus of leadership studies has been primarily on the leader and seeing the leader as uh, the cause of moving the group or the collective to action. But more recently in leadership studies is a focus on the follower because we know that leadership really is not done by the leader, that leadership is co-created by leaders and followers working together. So followership is a new topic that's emerging in the study of the leader-follower relationship. And one of the things that we know is that followers play an important part, not just in executing the goals of the group or the collective, but followers can play a big part in terms of assisting the leader in the leadership, or what we call co-creating leadership. And the only way he can find out is to find out what the followers think of the leadership. The leadership comes through the support that the boss provides, and the only way to find out how good that support is and whether he's really, I mean, am I leading him toward being dishonest somehow? Am I leading him toward really caring about the work? How am I leading? Well, you go down and ask the employees. Am I helping you? Are the tools good enough? Was the training good enough? What is disrupting you? How can I do better for you? How can I prove my support? And they will start telling you. They will tell you everything about it eventually if they learn to trust you because you really take the appropriate action. But followers also play an important part in keeping the leader's behavior in line, um, particularly when the leader is headed down the wrong path. It's the role of the followers to check the leader and to, um, to be sort of a reality check and help the leader to get back on the right path. Leadership is a concept which is um, not easy to define, but essentially it's a, it's a role which people occupy. And it's a role which they need an ability or a skill to perform. So leadership, the word, encompasses both the role or the position of being a leader and also the ability or the skill to do it. To be an effective leader, you need to be able to help a group to achieve the task. You need to be able to build a team so that you have synergy, more than the parts. And thirdly, you need to develop and motivate and stimulate the individual. And the key there is the ability to get the best out of people. What is effective leadership? Hundreds of books, thousands of articles have been written on what is effective leadership. I'm here to set it all straight for you. Leadership is very simple. Leadership is about, about your ability to influence individuals or groups of people towards the attainment of a goal. It says, the true measure of leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. 
that leadership is influence. Influence is leadership. The person in any given group that has the most influence at any given time for any given reason is the leader of the group. Now you can use power to influence people, but typically power has a fairly short half-life. True influence comes from the quality of the relationship you have with a person or a group of people. So if you want to be an effective leader, if you want to influence other people, it's about the relationship you have with them. So to be a good leader, you have to learn relational skills. You have to get really good at connecting with other people and building a, a meaningful relationship with them. Leaders only have one thing, they have followers. A follower is somebody who raises their hand and volunteers to go where you're going. They raise their hand and volunteer to go in the direction that you're pointing. Um, and so to lead others means that you have a clear, a clear vision of a world that does not yet exist, a world that could exist. And by articulating that cause, that vision, that purpose over and over and over again, it inspires people who believe what you believe, who want to see that world built, to join, to, to, to go with you, to figure out ways. That you you know? do. And leadership simply means you innovate and you have a great attitude, you commit to doing great work and you lead by example. Ultimately, you use your life for a meaningful purpose. People look most frequently for four things from their leadership. Hope, trust, compassion, and stability. If you have those four characteristics, you're on your way to be a good leader. Now, more effective leaders ask themselves deeper questions. What am I observing? What am I feeling? What's the unmet need? And how do I most creatively fulfill that need? A responsible leader is one who demonstrates fairness, transparency, and accountability in every one of his or her interactions or transactions with every stakeholder. The responsible leadership uh, makes you sleep well at night because you have discharged every one of your obligations fairly and squarely to every one of the stakeholders. I would say a good leader is a person who produces results and develops people in the level where they're expected to lead. Leadership is an attitude and a presence rather than a management technique. It's about how somebody enters a room, interacts with a group of people, rather than following some sort of technique or method. It usually involves vision and influence. A leader is somebody who holds a vision and is responsible for a vision and then tries to influence people then towards that vision. I think there's a, a huge human and people component of that. And that's why I'm so passionate about both things. I'm passionate about leadership because it's about people. It's about getting people to goals. It's about making a difference for them. It's about making them happy. Leadership is your commitment and your awareness that everything you do, everything you say, your attitudes, the way you react and act in any situation, especially difficult people in situations, people are watching. Leadership means that people are aware that people are watching what you do and say and could possibly be a witness to that and then imitate those behaviors and attitudes later. Leadership is a commitment to having character and doing the right thing. The best leaders I've met who lead people are people who love leading people. They just love it. It's not a chore for them. They don't hate it. They come to work every day. They're motivated. They're enthusiastic. They love leading people. Well, if you love leading people, then you're probably going to take it serious. You're probably going to study it. You're going to try to get better. You care. And if you don't love leading people, you're often just faking it. And I've thought a lot about this. And when I boil it down to its most basic level, to me, leadership is ultimately a decision. Every single day, we as leaders have to make some critical decisions about leadership. And it's not just every day. At critical moments in our career, we have to ask ourselves some fundamental questions about leadership roles. Maybe it's the first time you're being asked to take on a leadership role as a supervisor. Or maybe you want to become a more senior leader or when you first enter the executive ranks. At those critical moments, we have to pause and make what I call big D decisions. And why are they big? Because 
you taking on that role matter. At each of these moments, you have to pause and ask yourself some fundamental questions. Are you really ready to take on the leadership role? Are you prepared for the increased pressure that's going to come with it? Do you really want to take it on? And are you willing to hold yourself to even a higher standard of leadership behavior? Those are big D decisions that require you to take a time out, pause, and reflect on those questions. True leadership always benefits the greater good. If I throw in with you, if I follow you voluntarily as a leader and you win, I benefit as well. It wasn't unilateral. It wasn't me helping you get ahead. It was you helping us get ahead. The difficulty though with leadership is that people can get promoted into being a leader or elected into being a leader without making a couple of fundamental choices and, and they rush straight to a vision and influence. The two choices that every leader must make are firstly, uh, something isn't good enough or something uh, we can do better than this. So it's like they get some sort of emotional cause. And then the second choice they make, of course, is that they're going to do something about it. They're going to lead from the front. Now what that means is that leadership can come from anywhere. It doesn't have to be the boss, it doesn't have to be the government, it doesn't have to be the captain on the team. Anyone with those two choices made can become a leader. If you want to be a leader in today's world, you have to lead from the front. If you're not leading from the front, you're not leading. You're doing something. Harvard's Marty Lenski defines leadership as disappointing your own people at a rate they can absorb. So while the challenge is finding that optimal rate of absorption, we have to all agree as community leaders that standing still is not it. Slow progress is better than no progress. The key to a stronger team, a better organization, a greater community is to strive for constant forward movement. Most leaders today don't really understand that leadership is a science and an art. The science side is understanding the business. The art side is understanding people. Many leaders today, they've been promoted because they've done the job extremely well and they've returned profits to the bottom line for the organization. But really when it comes down to it, they don't have a schmick of an idea on how to lead people. And that is the art side of the business, the soft side of uh, of doing the business, understanding people. What makes people tick? What are my expectations of people? Have I clearly articulated what needs to be done? And then again, once that is done, holding people responsible for their actions. Dude, I believe that all service or all leadership is service leadership. And it's interesting, you know, culturally, servant is one of those words that has some negative connotations, especially among younger employees, because they, they think in terms of servile or being a, a servant. And that misses the greater point. It's not about uh, subjugating yourself to some kind of power down uh, position or being taken advantage of. It's about supporting a greater cause that you support both for the value of the cause and because it's a win-win proposition for both you and your organization. So I, I think it's, it's more like service leadership than servant leadership. In a world of uh, giving speeches about management, there is one quite lovely quote that is so overused that I find it nauseating that anybody would ever use it again, and so I'm about to use it again. It is a Gandhi line, and it says, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. If you got a giant campaign going on relative to improve quality and everything from tying your shoes to the way your office looks or what have you, even though I'm hardly a neat freak myself, has got to echo and or magnify the quote unquote policy message you are trying to sell. Uh, if you look scared of your shadow and you're trying to sell innovation, forget about it. Increasing the the world is moving faster. Increasingly, organizations have to keep up with that speed. Increasingly, they need to change. 
and therefore increasingly they need people who can provide leadership and not just at the top but um, in the middle and even uh, young people uh, doing projects or being a, uh, the head of a task force at lower levels. And things are moving so quickly you're going to have to work with multiple leaders. There's no way one person can absorb and deal with all of the issues that are coming up. So this notion of building a network of leaders in your organization to be able to deal with the opportunities and also the issues is going to be vitally important. I do believe that one of the best indicators of leadership is a leader's track record in developing leaders. And um, I, uh, I will frequently focus on three areas when I'm interviewing or when I'm talking to people. And one is certainly on performance because you always want to have leaders who are committed to high performance in good markets, bad markets, diverse global markets, handling a wide range of different scenarios. Secondly, I always focus on what's their track record of developing future leaders. And uh, one of my favorite questions is to ask people, you know, name the three or four leaders that if I went out and asked you know, them who had the biggest impact on their career and how they do that, who are those four people that you would name? And at a senior level, if they can't name three or four fairly senior level people, then immediately I question their wherewithal in people development. And last, I'll ask, how do they move their businesses? How do they develop talent with our credo in mind? And uh, so for me, it gives me an indication of how committed they are to developing individuals, to developing teams, you know, and frankly, figuring out how to work through others to get their jobs done. I think the dilemma is that as complex as our organizations have grown, as fast as the environment is changing, there are just not enough extraordinary leaders to go around. You know, you, you look at what we expect from a leader day. We expect somebody to be confident and yet humble. We expect them to be very strong in themselves but open to being influenced. We expect them to be amazingly prescient with great foresight to, but be, to be practical as well, to be extremely bold and also prudent. I mean, how many people like the, that are out there? Not, I haven't met very many. Right? People have the innovation instincts of Steve Jobs, the political skills of Lee Kuan Yew, and the emotional intelligence of Desmond Tutu. Like, that's a pretty small set. And yet, we've built organizations where you almost need that caliber of person for them to run, if you locate so much of the decision-making authority in the top of the organization. So here we are in a world of amazing complexity, and complex organizations that just, they just require too much of those few people at the top. They don't have the intellectual diversity, the bandwidth, the time to really make all these critical decisions. You know, there's, there's a reason that so often in organizations, change is, is belated, it is infrequent, it is uh, uh, convulsive, because typically in those traditional structures, by the time a small team at the top realizes there's a need for fundamental change, by the time a problem is big enough, or an opportunity clear enough that it prompts action, that it breaks through all the levels, commands the attention of these extraordinarily busy people at the top, it's too late. So if we want to build truly adaptable organizations, we have to syndicate the work of leadership more broadly. The type of people that we need are not the conformists. They're the radicals. We don't need more people that think the old way or think the same way. We need the people that think differently. So if I'm the CEO of an organization, what I'm looking for is not the same. I'm looking for different. And if you go on a search for different, here's what you're going to find. In every organization, you're going to find people that are just a little bit different. I don't care if you call them misfits. I don't care if you call them deviants. I don't care if you call them weirdos. But I'm going to tell you right now, the people that matter most are the people that are just a little bit different, who come at issues and problems and challenges from a different angle. We aren't smart enough to be able to make sense out of what's happening. We only can make sense when we're prepared to spread out the inputs that we have and collect back alternative points of view. And an organization is not going to be great today in this environment without a willingness to embrace 
the strange opinions, the weird ideas, and the different points of view that come from people that are wired just a little bit differently. They have value. To ignore that value of the deviant, to ignore that value of the person that's just a little bit different in the way they view the world is putting your organization at jeopardy. One of the contemporary questions of leadership today is we're, you know, leadership is very trendy right now. Um, I call it adjective leadership. Adjective leadership says, I guarantee you this week there'll be three new books on leadership, but they'll have a different adjective. Inner leadership, outer leadership, alien leadership, historical leadership, you know, you know, it, it, you know of the making of many books, there is no end. The problem that I have is that there, there's, there's two fundamental challenges in contemporary leadership. Number one is people don't know why they want to lead. They know they want to be leaders. So that's different than wanting to lead. As I realized when I was president of the uh, University of Cincinnati, I wanted to be president. I just didn't want to do president, <laughs> which was an impediment to his career. Because he wanted the position. He didn't want the responsibilities that went with it. So number one is, I, I always begin when I work with leaders by asking a fundamental question. Why do you want to lead? Because the why's got to precede the what or the how. We can only see the things we have words for. Right? And this is why the leader must provide a clear vision. Why are we doing this? Why are we in business in the first place? What is the point of growing the company that you're growing? Everybody talks about, what's your goal? Growth. What, what's the point of the growth? In other words, you have a company. Why do you have that company? What is the value your company is offering to others? And, and what, what do you want your company to leave behind when you're gone? There has to be a purpose for why your company exists beyond the things you make, beyond the things you do, beyond the money you make. You had the purpose when you founded the company, otherwise you wouldn't have taken the crazy risk to start it with the overwhelming chance of failure. And people wouldn't have given you blood, sweat, and tears if they didn't believe in you because you were the alpha, you had the vision, you had the strength, and they wanted your protection. And they joined you and they gave you their blood, sweat, and tears because you gave them a sense of purpose and belonging and protection. So the first thing you have to do when you are a leader, when you are in a position of leadership, is to ask yourself, what is my vision? What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to accomplish? Where am I taking the organization to? What is it that I am asking my team? And the vision is not a strategy, is not a goal, is not your plan. Those are tools to accomplish your vision. Vision is not to increase sales 10% or to decrease costs 5%. Vision is about a dream that you want to take everyone to. Some leaders say that's about ideas, that vision is about the ideas, to define them, to communicate them, and to make sure everyone understands it. I agree, but I also think that to that vision you need to put emotion. You need to know how to turn that vision, that idea, into emotions in yourself and in the team. Because the emotions is what makes you jump out of bed every morning. It's what makes your team jump out of bed every morning. And the emotions that making a difference, learning, growing, really making a change in the world around you. Well, you see, what's true for you is also true for the people who work with you. If in order to function at optimal levels and be at your best, you need to be liked and you need to feel competent, so do the people who work for you. Your people want to be liked and they want to feel competent. So the more as a leader you can tell people that you like them and tell them what you need them to do and you believe in their competence, the more you'll set up a constructive relationship for getting things done. Strong leaders actually bring out the best in people. Being able to bring out the best in people is largely based on the expectations that you have about them. Leaders who treat people in a way that supports their self-confidence make it possible for people to achieve extraordinary things that they initially thought were impossible. So if you want very, very high performance out of employees, well, you, you really have to listen to them a lot and respond correctly to them 
and they will become fully committed and fully motivated to do the very best work. I think it's important in our work we talk about two different types of leaders. There's one leadership disposition that is about fear stoking. They're putting fear inside of people in order to get things done and hold them accountable. Fear is a huge motivator and it, and it frankly works, otherwise they wouldn't do it. But it has debilitating impact over a long period of time. So if you're in fearing people and stoking their fears and anxiety, it displaces their courage and causes them to be discouraged. We call those spillers because they're spilling the courage of the people that work for them. I contrast that with the other leadership disposition, and this is a leader who nudges people into discomfort for the good of their own career, who sometimes is tough so that that person grows into new skills, who doesn't accept lower standards, uh, and this person ends up putting courage inside of the individual. They actually encourage them. And so we call this person a filler. So we contrast between spillers and fillers. And in my own life, my own life example of this, is I, I reported to two people at the same time when I worked for Accenture, one of the world's largest management consulting companies. And one of the leaders would look at a situation and they would go, oh, look at that. That's a problem. Do you realize how that puts us at risk? That is a problem that's getting ready to explode. And if you don't handle that, you're going to be in big trouble. This is on you. Do you understand? So it's motivating me to be really conscientious by their fear. I want you to be afraid. The other leader that I reported to, at the same time, would look at a very similar situation, kind of go, well, Bill, there's a lot of opportunity there. There's a lot of opportunity there. And if you're able to clean that situation up, I think it'll be good for your career. Because you've been trying to develop these skills, and if you think about it, this situation is ripe for the development of those skills. I'm going to help you. I'm going to support you. I know it's going to be hard, but I'm here with you. Now, which one do you think I rather would work for? Now, both of them I'm going to do a good job for. I'm going to be very afraid of not screwing up for this person, and I'll do a good job. But I want to impress this person and do a good job. The distinction to me comes down to this. The most overused phrase in the history of business. What keeps you awake at night? What keeps you awake at night? Why are we proud to answer what keeps you awake at night? As if fear and anxiety is some badge of leadership honor. What keeps you awake at night gets you talking about your fears, the risks that are out there, the problems, the things we have to be critical about. I'd rather work for a leader who talks about what gets them up in the morning. One of the things that I've personally found and experienced working for almost 40 years now doing this is that one of the key ingredients is having leaders really understand and come to terms with what their personal purpose is. In other words, how do they make a difference? Uh, what is it that they can do? Uh, how do they create meaning in their lives? What gets them up in the morning going through a, a horrendous day, if you will, with a lot of crisis? And what I've concluded is that purpose has got to be the driving force. And so I personally have done a lot of work on my purpose. And so simply stated, uh, I'm committed to being a catalyst for personal transformation to enable possibilities. And the exciting news for me is I get a chance to apply that to all of my engagements because essentially what I'm doing is helping them transform themselves. So I'm not doing it, but I'm, we're creating the environment where they can do it themselves, which is much more powerful. You will make mistakes. And are you going to be able to get up off the ground when you get smacked down and keep driving? That this persistence, resilience, I think is very important. It's okay to make a mistake. Making a mistake has great value. You can go down and admit to the person, oh, I made a mistake, I'm very sorry, I apologize. You've got to apologize for your bad leadership. The, the best thing to do when, they, when you find out some bad leadership is say, oh, it's my fault, I apologize for making a mistake and not giving you a good enough tool. So go out and make your mistakes. That's how I learned. And, and it's fine, but if, if you admit to them, by the way, admission of error is something that you need to have all employees do. So when you admit to them, if the boss can admit to them, I certainly can admit to mine. Otherwise, they're going to be hiding them. So it's something you, you want to take advantage of your mistakes. Don't feel bad for your mistakes. Feel bad if you don't correct them. And go down and admit, I made that mistake, but this is the way I'm going to correct it. So get out there. Get out there and practice. And I think the most important thing that a new leader can have stepping into a role is humility, is understanding that they're going to learn, that they're going to make mistakes, and uh, to you know, approach the scenarios something where they're going to have to grow into. 
And, um, and I think having that kind of a mindset uh, will immediately endear the people who are working with you and around you. They're not looking for a perfect leader. They want a leader that cares about them and who's going to help them try to be better. And uh, I think as a new leader, if you remember that, uh, that they expect you to be human, that you're going to make mistakes, uh, and that as long as you learn and, and care for the people who are working with you, I think that's the most important thing that you can do. Throughout history, at fairly regular intervals, somebody presents us with a new thought. Somebody has a new idea. Somebody has a new concept, a new product. And it's really fascinating to watch what happens. When that first new idea is put out there, people kind of go, whoa, I'm not sure. That's not going to work, or how's that going to work? And if it's a good idea, it survives. And then in a very short period of time later, you find what was kind of an eccentric idea has all of a sudden become a mainstream idea, and we all got to have it. We've seen this with the iPod. We've seen this with all of the kind of digital technology. Those that ignored the faint signals from the periphery and were not open to the new crazy ideas of the time ended up on the rubbish heap. People like Kodak is a perfect example. They had the market, they lost it. There's story after story after story of companies who failed to follow their instincts on a new idea, an outlandish idea, a crazy idea that was just slightly ahead of its time, but all of a sudden went mainstream. And when that tipping point arrives, you cannot make up for the lost opportunity.